this. Wednesday night, and we're going to start streaming here on Facebook. Those watching on YouTube can join us on Facebook sometimes live as well, but just happy you're watching. Um, but Wednesday, Sundays, we're on Facebook Live first. You can join in on the conversation as well. And I'm about to bring in our friends on Facebook uh, right about now. So Here we go, here we go, here we go. It's a big day for UH football fans. It's a scary day for UH football fans as well when we're hearing reports that all team activity has been halted. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. But today we're going to talk about Coach Todd Graham. We're going to let you come in. Uh, we're going to let everybody kind of get acquainted in here. I'm going to make sure that my monitor here is set, my delay. So nothing crazy can happen if I have a delay. Yeah, let's see how my music is back. Cool. All right, so that's good. Wow. Uh, well, as you folks start coming in, see some, I want to get some comments. So share some comments with me. Let me know where you are, uh, what's going on. You're watching the finals. I was watching the finals. And uh, sad for the Heat. I mean, the Lakers are a great team. I expect the Lakers to win the finals. I uh, thought they were favorites this year. I thought the Clippers, they probably would have challenged the Clippers, or the Clippers would have challenged them the best. But... Um, obviously, you know how that worked out. So for NBA fans, I'm a pure NBA fan. I just love the game, the league. I wanted to see the best game. So I would love to see, and in Kobe's memory, obviously, uh, the Lakers winning the title would be amazing. Uh, it would also be kind of sad, though, because how are you going to have a parade if you don't can't go outside? So maybe it's going to be like Tampa Bay Lightning today, right? The Stanley Cup. Did you see how they celebrated out on the bay? They were uh, with their boats and uh, with their flags and um, a lot of different kinds of flags on boats I've been seeing lately, but that's a different story. Um, but wow, what a crazy era we're living in where the NBA Finals is literally on the last day of September. We're here, it's the last day of September. It's about to be October tomorrow. So if you have any resolutions you want to do, I have a few resolutions that I want to do. Well, hopefully it ends uh, watching UH football. So by the end of the month starting tomorrow, uh, which is also going to be Halloween, there should be a game on Halloween. Um, so that would be really cool. And uh, for some of you that don't know this yet, um, so shout out to Aloha Stadium, but they're putting on a uh, trunk or treat type thing. So be on the lookout for that as well. And I plan on being a vendor there. If we if we have a game, I don't know what they're going to do, but that would be so cool. Nonetheless, I don't know. But we need something exciting and fun to go on, right, for us fans. And um, today, it was unfortunate, obviously, to hear that uh, there was a little bit of a COVID outbreak outbreak type scenario of four players. So I'm not sure if it qualifies for an outbreak. But certainly, those four players have been around the rest of the program um, for a uh, considerable, uh, considerable amount of time now, certainly in recent days as practice has started. So um, thankfully, the virus is uh, while infectious um, and not something that I would personally want to get um, you know it's it's not like if you stand next to somebody with it you're definitely going to transmit it or you're going to get it so um, but there is always a chance so that's what we're trying to minimize and mitigate and that's what the school is trying to do that's what the university is trying to do that's what the conference is trying to do with their testing and they have a lot of tests so I'm sure with the conference policy and that's why it started the way it is and that's why we talked about it the way that we did or the way that I did last week about the Mountain West starting is because it's just the clock starting, right? Craig Thompson's like pressing the button, right? He's like, okay, we're starting practice now, go. And then we're gonna start competition, okay, on this day, go, okay. Are you gonna be ready? I don't know. That's why they're like, oh, are, is this team gonna play? He's like, eh. It's like, we're starting. The Mountain West, we are starting. Whether you guys gonna start with us, that's TBA, that's TBD, that's, uh, hopefully still and that's something that we need to be honest with as fans um, and I hope to be there too that's something that uh, um, you know a lot of my friends have been talking about too because I've been to 60 straight home and away games now haven't missed a game periods for five years October 31st 2015 and we're gonna have a game October 31st 2020 how crazy is that so maybe it'll be um, in the stands again and hopefully not as scary because that game in 2015 which was Norm Chow's last game we got annihilated by Air Force um, but 
that's how long ago. I haven't missed a single game since then. I haven't been in attend, uh, not in attendance for a home or away game since then, and um, I would not change it for anything. It was so much fun, and I it's just the beginning. And there's so many more adventures to go with, so many more friends to meet and family to make. So uh, I'm hoping you can come with me. Another one of my streaks broken is my NBA final streak. I got to go to see the last two trophies. I was there in Cleveland two years ago in uh, June of 2018. And last year I was um, in Oakland, the last game ever to be played there in that arena at Oracle. So um, that was a cool experience. And I got to see the trophy handed out twice in a row. So barring a player um, sneaking me in or like putting me on their guest list, which is possible. Hey, we got some people with connections out there. Come on, get me on the guest list. Give me my third straight finals. Uh, that would be awesome. But that that streak might come to an end, probably. I'm going to say almost definitely. But Hawaii football, 60 games. Don't you want me to see 61? Come on, you got to let me get in. So hopefully we can, as fans, uh, hopefully as media. I don't know how many media members they'll let in, obviously. Uh, I could be a credential member of the media. And I, I've done it before through UH. So... Um, I, I would love to do it that way as well, uh, just because I think growing this this team and this game and this fan base and the support is is it's really the paramount task that we have at hand for all of us, and that's everyone's kulei on us fans, as stakeholders within this program, it's people that live in Hawaii, it's people that pay tax dollars, and that's something that's going to be brought up a lot as well um, in terms of how we spend that money, our public funds to go to this team, and how, why we need to support this team, but also understanding why this team and why football why this game why competition is so healthy for uh you know the sustenance and uh, the sustainability of our island culture which is being together as families being in the stands being outdoors um, being centered around sports that's something a part of us um, whether it was you know within our your our identity as islanders as as na native people sport competition is always at the center of that and always our family is as well so that's a big reason why we want to keep this train going forever and ever and ever but um, as we know um, it's not always easy to run a division one program and it's not always easy uh, for any company in a time of recession and, and any economic instability to run anything but that's going to be the task at hand so we'll see how that goes for our department as they navigate this and uh, you know and but at the same time Dave, uh, Dave Matlin hired uh, Todd Graham and made a choice in Todd Graham, a clearly a qualified individual who brings a lot of excitement to this program. And the more I learn about him, the more I'm excited about him. Uh, shout out to Auntie Penny, uh, the team mom, Auntie Penny Graham, uh, we'll call her. She is a wonderful light that a lot of people have been able to, um, whether, you know, um, interact with her online or some maybe even in person, she's somebody that definitely brings a lot of joy to our island and is definitely excited to be there. So we're excited to see, uh, meet her and, 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 and see the Grams in action together as a family on the field, in the stands, uh, wherever we can, because that's what we are as fans. We're one big family of UH football fans. Um, but what we're gonna do right now is uh, talk about Todd Graham because Todd Graham is uh, kind of, Still a mystery, mysterious type figure to a lot of us. I mean, my when when Todd Graham was hired, my first initial thought was a Hawaii Bowl because um, I remember first of all he has this signature like he wears like a sweat thing on his arm, which I think is cool because it sets him apart. It's like Belichick in the sleeves, like you kind of know that's like his thing on the sideline, like a, like a, instead of like a wristband sweatband, he wears it like kind of higher. Um, so I. You can kind of see, I don't, we have to ask him where that comes from as well when we get to talk to him, but um, they blew us out of the water. Uh, Brian Moniz threw four interceptions that day as well, which uh, does us right still, I think 10 years later for some of us, but um, at the same time, Tulsa was crazy good that day and, and scoring a lot of points and uh, you know putting um, a lot of pressure on our team as well, so I think Final score, I believe, it was 62. Hold on, let me see. I uh, was watching the old highlights again and um, of that game, 62-35. Uh, their quarterback, this guy named G.J. Kinney. Hmm, I've heard of him. Oh yeah, he's the new offensive coordinator. Uh, he went 17 of 31 with 346 uh, for 346 yards and three touchdowns. I feel like he threw more than 31 times. 
Um, but that's something we'll talk about as well because this offense, which is so high powered and something that relies a lot of on speed and receivers and guys who can stay conditioned, they run the ball a lot as well. So, um, you know, that's interesting. But one receiver in particular that day had, uh, or he rushed for 101 yards and two touchdowns, one of their receivers. So that's something to think about as well. Um, but Todd Graham, where was he last? Well, can you imagine this? Uh, you are doing pretty well in a Power 5 conference, kind of slowly building, um, kind of staying in the middle area, but showing promise. And you do something outside of winning the conference, outside of winning the Rose Bowl in the Pac-12. Probably when you're at Arizona State, the one thing you got to do every year, even if you don't win any of the games, you want to beat University of Arizona. And this man did that. What was strange was the very next day, while Tempe, Arizona is still celebrating, like only Tempe, Arizona can. I should do a whole episode on Tempe and that craziness at Arizona State. That's a fun craziness too. Todd Graham was um, given some crazy news. What a difference 24 hours makes, guys. The Sun Devils riding high on Saturday night after beating bitter rival Arizona at Sun Devil Stadium. Then, most fans waking up to the news their head coach is fired. Like the decision or not, it's an odd feeling for some fans in Tempe. Where to go, coach? Man, what a football game. We, we poured our heart and soul in this place, and, uh, uh, and I'm proud of it. Just an odd 24 hours for the Sun Devil football program. I just think it's weird the timing of it all. The change came so drastically after such a good win. To some, Todd Graham's firing is a cloud of uncertainty. <laughs> right in the middle of a rivalry celebration. Hopefully it was for the best for the program. That's, that's all I can say. The news not really surprising these fans on Mill Avenue. ASU wants better than 75. But a little stunned at the timing. I figured because we beat U of A, they would they would let him finish out. And Todd Graham will coach. Oh, what a difference 24 hours makes, guys. The Sun Devils riding high on Saturday night after beating bitter rival Arizona at Sun Devil Stadium. Then most fans waking up to the news their head coach is fired. Like the decision or not, it's an odd feeling for some fans in Tempe. And what a football game. We, we poured our heart and soul in this place, and, uh, uh, and I'm proud of it. Just an odd 24 hours for the Sun Devil football program. I just think it's weird, the timing of it all. The change came so drastically after such a good win. To some, Todd Graham's firing is a cloud of uncertainty. <laughs> right in the middle of a rivalry celebration. Hopefully it was for the best for the program. That's, that's all I can say. The news not really surprising these fans on Mill Avenue. ASU wants better than 75. But a little stunned at the timing. I figured because we beat U of A, they would, they would let him finish out. And Todd Graham will coach ASU in the bowl game. That's something he wants to do. I'm fired up. As a matter of fact, I, that was the first thing that entered my mind was, I want to finish. But the search for his replacement is on effective immediately, and the fans they want more than they're getting right now. We definitely need to establish a tradition of being a top class football team. You know, all the money we put in this, all the money we put in the stadium, we, we should have a better football team than this. As for the guy to make it happen. Just hopefully someone has the, the right mindset and can get the job done. Somebody that's humble and, you know, knows what we need and what to recruit for. It's a costly move for ASU. The university has to pay Graham the $12 million remaining on his contract just to be able to fire him. In the Live Alert Center, Ryan Cody, 12 News at 10. Okay, now I have my mic on, sorry. Uh, there's a little bit of delay as I'm kind of watching it with you folks, but at the same time watching delay and being live at the same time. So it's crazy. But Coach Todd Graham, uh, that was his last stop. So that was three years ago. Um, they, he did coach that bowl game at Arizona State, and they ended up losing that game, actually. So his last game, his last game at Arizona State was 52-31 to 31 loss. But he had some highs there, uh, number 12 in that final AP poll um, in 2014. Uh, you know, just some, you know, great, 
and they beat you know they had some great great teams there and some mediocre teams but overall i mean he did pretty well there and i think uh I mean, it's the pac-12 so recruiting against a lot of tough powerhouses um, but also you're the pac-12 so it's nice to be in the pac-12 right it's nice to get those kind of athletes asu is a great place to go to school um great place to live right there in tempe phoenix area so uh, but um i think it makes you excited because that's that's not always the same reaction that you're going to get right when you uh hear about where coach came last right like you see that was funny one thing i saw watching the opening press conference and then watching his departing press conference i mean his enthusiasm is not much different i mean this is a guy that is excited about the opportunity and excited to have had the opportunity and i think that says a lot about um, how he's approaching this opportunity to coach UH because he sees it as a blessing for him um, clearly, he's a man of faith in uh, Christian faith, uh, many faiths. So that's something we also need to remember. Um, but clearly, somebody that's very grounded in his in his Christian faith, and someone that is um, used uh, is, is not afraid to show how it how it's uh, supported him through his career. And it's um, you know you can't blame him for his philosophies, can't blame him for his the way he lives and what he does in the field because he's been pretty successful and. Uh, you know, financially at the Pac-12, they pay you pretty handsomely. I mean, they already do at Division One level anywhere, uh, but there, I'm sure, uh, you know, that's a nice blessing as well. Um, but that's where he left off last. But I'm gonna share some videos. Uh, here's something before he was left Arizona State. The media talked to him about his offensive philosophy. I, the date, I believe, was in 2017, the same year he was released as well. Fifth quarter, so we're trying to. That's the wrong clip. So when I when I went about that process, I, when I want to hire a great person, and I want to have someone that I'm not I'm not convinced I'm not one of these guys to go hire some scheme guy, and hey, he gonna run whatever he wants to. Nope, that's not. I've been through Major Applewhite, Gus Malzahn, Chad Morris, Mike Norvell. Been through all of them. We've run the same system because it's a system that I believe in. You have to run the football. You have to be a run play action pass team, and we're a spread. We're a tempo team, uh, and and you know and that's all about snaps, and we have a philosophy for that. But, so when I when I went about that process, I, when I want to hire a great person, and I want to have someone that I'm not I'm not convinced I'm not one of these guys to go hire some scheme guy, and hey, he gonna run whatever he wants to. Nope. So you probably heard that a couple of times because I'm I'm I played it a few times, but uh, tell me if you didn't hear the clip. I'm pretty sure you heard the whole clip, but he ran down, talked about his philosophy about running, uh, how important that is. That's the first thing, right? We think, well, this guy's gonna start throwing a lot of for a lot of yards, but. Yes, it still will happen as well. And that's so exciting too, is that he can talk about running off the play action and the tempo, uh, running no huddle. So I, I didn't show the, a part of that clip before was, uh, it's like, I think it was probably just one of his rudimentary, like weekly press conferences there that he had with his, um, you know, there at the Pac-12. So it wasn't like he, uh, it wasn't like a post game or something. He still seemed like he was a little annoyed. And that's kind of similar when Norm Chow, his last year at UH, you know, even before the rumblings of him eventually being fired, which he was, um, his relationship with the media started to turn, you could tell, just the way that he would talk on camera and the way that he'd get annoyed really easily. Um, and, uh, you know, you get it, because there's tension there. We all live through it, right? If you're an adult, if you work in the real world, it's what happens, right? Your employer and you can be awkward. Um, but uh, a couple things I want to point out in that, that that short clip. Well, first of all, sorry, he says the reporter compared the offense to Alabama or something, right? He was like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa!" Like we run what we run, Alabama run, runs what they run. Um, and you know, especially when you think about Alabama and you think about Auburn, their rival, and you think about Gus Malzahn, who won a national championship at Auburn, who before Auburn was offensive coordinator for none other than Todd Graham. It's very exciting. Um, and he, he named a bunch of people, Mark Norvell, right? Norvell is like coach of Florida State right now. So a lot of people, it's not like he's guys from his staff are just, and, and that's exciting for the people on his staff. I mean, gosh, if you think about all the people that this guy, uh, you know, it's really helped to mentor to another job in division one or wherever, that's pretty exciting. And uh, I think anybody that would, um, you know, want to be a part of this program right now should be thinking about that whether you're a coach whether you're a player 
right now we saw one of his former players Brandon Ayuk for the 49ers somebody that I picked up in my fantasy I just I saw he was still available so I just snagged him um because I think that he will be incorporated a lot into the Niner offense but looking at what he did for the Niners running out of the backfield hand off those jet sweeps um we could see a lot of that again at UH so that's kind of exciting as well I love seeing the receivers get used like down the outside um but in terms of his base coaching philosophy I have a clip where he um kind of breaks it down from the very base so we're looking at where the coach uh we're gonna talk about the offense right now we'll talk about the defense another day um but coach graham in terms of his offensive philosophy this is um how it's gonna break down so take a look at this clip and we'll talk about it right now so when i when i of course i chose the wrong clip again <laughs> oh gosh a fifth quarter so we're trying to run plays faster and more efficient and it goes back to who you recruit and how you train them so you have to be disciplined highly disciplined to be able to run this system and it's a run play action pass system so just a basic you know basic formationally what they're trying to do obviously we're running out of a gun and we'll be in some type of 11 personnel you'll have a tight end where it can be the inline tight end like this or this tight end can be back in the backfield back here all right, and we like to put them back in the backfield for movement, things like that. But we don't want to be slowing down at all. So basically, what they do, it's a it's a run, play, action, pass offense, which is a lot of people talk as an RPO. So what 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 we're trying to accomplish, we want to have direct runs and be able to take advantage of the numbers. So obviously, what we do is on one side, this is on base downs. Obviously, this is you know first and second down. You'll have a take on one side. You will have a throw on one side and then you'll have a run. So the run is always opposite the take, all right? And then the throw is always to the run. So for example, if you're sitting here and you just draw up a defense, you, you just draw up a, you know, a, a, you know, a four, three looking defense like this. So basically the take, we, the, the quarterback's got to process all of this. And it's all about, you know, football's mathematics, angles, and numbers. So he's looking and seeing, okay, he's got three over two. If it was two over two, we're going to take the take, right? Mm -hmm. And so you've got a positive five to six yard gain every down and we're rolling. And that defense is having to run horizontally, sideline to sideline, okay? Then if it's three over two, now the take is off. So this is triple option number one. The second one is, is, is your run. Okay, and so what we do here is we come back and we look and see where is the safety. So the safety sitting here high. So you got two high, and based on this side, we're going to run a say a bang eight off this. This is a quick short post. And so what we would do is we would get angle. So we want to create angle. See, I think that that's easy blocking. See that? We're going to seal off that side there. We're going to take and. This guy thinks he's being red. Usually people are square shoulder. We'll pull and we're going, to, we're going to kick this guy out here. And so what we're going to do is we're creating a run game. That's like what we call a dark play. It's block down, kick out. It's a gap scheme. And see, no one's really getting downfield except this tight end and he can actually be downfield, okay? But he can't be blocking downfield if you throw it downfield. So basically, if the safety comes down, he has to come down to make that play, right? Mm -hmm. And if he does, you're going to throw this here. So you have a run and a throw. So you, here's your read. So this creates a triple option play. And obviously there's a, I explained that extremely fast. Right, but the quarterback's reading the safety. Yes, yeah. 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 He's gonna start his first progressions here. So if they lined up like this and they had just a safety and they put the backer back in the box, now guess what? We've got bad numbers for the run. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna run the take. Yeah. And we've got the right numbers on the passing game. So, so it, it is, it is, you know, football's mathematics and angles and personnel. And obviously, who is that guy? And who is this guy matters, right? But the most important thing is this guy right here getting us in the right play. And and these guys all understand what, what has to happen. It, it's so in the tempo it, from which you run it. So, in other words, when you come to the line of scrimmage, man, we've got to be able to take information, process it, and do it right the first time we're asked to do it now so that that's that's training that's discipline when you've been playing in a different system where it's slower and you huddle there's more time to process so the whole our whole deal is you know myself coach malzahn coach morris we come from making a living with guys with character and with discipline those things go hand in hand so you have to be extremely disciplined right now 
this is not happening. Yeah. It, it, the system is not operating. That's a lot, right? <clears throat> like you said to that reporter, uh, that you know, there's a lot that he, the process right there, and just imagine for a quarterback, and for Shevin, I think the good thing is um, he's been able to study this playbook and, and the tempo, and and I guess this philosophy for months now. But in practice, you know, I don't know. I mean, that's that's going to be different, and and I think uh, what he talks about there is very interesting. Um, because it, uh, you know, it allows us to see through the eyes of DJ Kinney and, and coach, uh, Todd Graham in terms of what they expect on every play. So when he talks about the run and talks about the take and the mismatches and the angles and the timing, I mean, it's very complicated and it's a, it's a scheme, um, that is built on its complexity and the rhythm. Right, like music, like tempo. You can't be off beat. All the players have to be on, even the block, even the line. And he showed how setting up that block, um, drawing in defenders, cutting, taking angles. I watched. Uh, he, uh, you know, he runs a lot of guys out of the slot or out of the backfield who are running routes out of the backfield. I mean, stuff like that is really cool to watch too. And and and, um, I mean, if you're watching, I don't know, Kansas City's chief offense. There's a lot of offenses, but it's very rare. My whole life, I've been able to say like it's really fun to watch the team that I like to watch. Um, have a great offense, but um, Andy Reid and just the way he's running with all of them right now, just the better that you get, the harder it is for um, the op opposition because this team is is built on, on rhythm and togetherness, and the more that they are that way, the better chance they have. Um, but uh, I'm going to bring in my friend Sean. We're going to talk about it some more. So I know Sean is watching, or Sean can hear me actually because he's on Zoom. So Sean can hear me. So you can unmute yourself, Sean. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Let's bring you in. Let's talk about um, what what we just saw there. I mean, what is what are your first um, just your first impressions of the video that uh, and what we we saw so far? Yeah, I, I love this stuff. It's like uh, back when June Jones was here and they were breaking down tape at Willows. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Exactly like that, right? And uh, like those right. th post games. So hopefully. Uh, Todd Graham will be doing more than that, but um, for you and you know, I know that you are um, you know excited about seeing uh, what Todd Graham can can put together on the field, and that uh, the X's and O's are something that you're really looking forward to. And um, from what we've seen so far, I mean, what um, what part what part or dimensions of his offense do you think excite you the most? It's going to be it's going to be like the run and shoot but but different. So. But the run and shoot but different, right? Because he talks about yeah. running. He talks about that base being running, right? And uh, you know, when I look back at like the, the stats, I mean, do you remember that game of Hawaii Bowl? I'm assuming you were there, right? That yeah, game where they there. blew us up. Yeah, I was there. I, I you know, I thought we were going to win. Me too. Uh, Me wait, too. I, didn't we have like some suspensions or we had some guys academically ineligible? That um, week. Uh, we might have, but I mean, yeah. Salas played, yeah, who they, was like our best player probably us, that year, you know, uh, Shane Austin came in and threw a crazy interception into like thin air too. So like we threw, I think five or six interceptions because Moniz had four as a self. Austin had at least yeah. one. Um, you know, that game is one of the worst games I ever saw at the stadium for sure. So <laughs> maybe this is the chance to turn it around <laughs> and flip it. <laughs> Uh, because some of the stuff they ran in there was pretty exotic, you know, compared to what we ran. And we were like, oh, where are the running shoot? And we went to the Sugar Bowl a few years ago, and everybody's talking about our offense. But it's like, okay, these guys came in, and you're like, oh, dang. Like, wow, what an offense, too. Um, but what do you remember about that day as well? I remember that the, they just threw it all over the place, and they just kept scoring. And I thought we were going to do what they did to us. You know, they came from Tulsa and, you know, we're at home. And I thought, we, I honestly thought we were going to win that game. So, like, I'm, I'm happy that he's on our side. I'm happy he's on, he's our coach. 
I'm glad we don't have like a rookie coach. He's been around the block. He's won everywhere he's gone, mm-hmm. and it usually doesn't take him very much, uh, very, very long to get his system in place and and get get going. Uh, Auntie Penny says hi, Sean. She's saying hi to you. Yeah, hi, Auntie Penny. Um, <laughs> hi, Steph. <laughs> um, so Deanne also asked how long they won't be practicing. I'm sure it's some, I, the the tests apparently are within a day, like these tests that they got, yeah. like this new thing. So should be quick. It should be able to isolate players. I don't think there's anything to worry about. I mean, this is anticipated. This was going to happen. The good thing is it's pretty early. The good thing is, like, um, you know, there's still time for the season. And I think October 24th is a little bit of an ambitious start date, personally. And I think perhaps that was due on purpose because they're like, we're going to just try and get all the games in anyways. But like Craig Craig Thompson and their philosophy is we're going to just start and see who can play. Like, October 24th is going to come, and whoever plays that day is going to play. I mean, we already don't even know when the Titans and the Steelers, right? They're, who are they playing, Titans, next are supposed to play? But are they going to have the... Yeah, uh, Titans and Steelers, they're, saying, they're shooting for Monday, Monday or Tuesday. Or Tuesday or Wednesday. Tuesday or Wednesday or something, too, right? Tuesday even Wednesday? Or Wednesday. Oh, okay. I, oh, I thought even okay. Wednesday. Possibly Monday, Tuesday. But, I mean, like, yeah. there's more flexibility, obviously, there. But I think, you know, even if we have to cancel a game, forfeit a game, not forfeit, but cancel a game, it is what it is. I feel like this this year is kind of just like cherry, and hopefully, yeah, we can win the, the championship, and that's the goal every year. But this year, you only got to do it in two months. You got to just be hot from the beginning, and this offense right. clearly, um, you know, you need to be able to uh, listen to your coaches, understand what they're saying, understand the philosophy, not just like internalize what his process is, because. In that quick video right there, everybody on the offense needs to know that, right? Like, like, like the guy said, like the center needs to understand the philosophy. It needs. It's not just where do people go on each play. It's why do they go here on that play? It's why do we line up a certain mm-hmm. way? If we have three DBs on two receivers on the outside, and we're we're um, you know we're manipulating the the uh, mismatches or whatever or the numbers, mm-hmm. we're, but. You have to understand that, even as a casual watcher of the game, because you'll be like, what's going on? Sometimes, you know, Coach Chow, his philosophy was, hmm, we just knew it was run, run, pass most of the time. But, um, right. you know, like, this is definitely much more complex, right? Yeah, it's, it's kind of uh, similar to the run and shoot concepts. You know, you play off what the defense shows you. Um, I think one of the things that Shevin did better than uh, Cole was, temp- was, you know, tempo. He got up and he ran plays and th- there would be just that spark. So mm-hmm. I think this is a great offense for Shevin. I think he's going to flourish in it. Um, he can throw the deep ball. And I, I think it's, I think the potential is there. You know, I, I think we could win a Mountain West championship. Yeah. Even if it is in Boise. Yeah. No, I think we could as well. Uh, it's funny. So Deanne says about the schedule of bye. So that, that schedule is old. That whole schedule is, is pow. That's not our schedule anymore. Yeah. Yeah, um, like whatever's on the website is trash. not the schedule. What we're waiting for to come out is a schedule, which will determine whatever we're going to play in the next couple of weeks. So that we could be in Nevada the whole time. We could be, who knows, you know, <laughs> and Nevada today, if you saw, I tweeted out as well, the Hawaii sports fans that they're going to allow 10% capacity at their games. <laughs> it's funny. They said 6,500 at the UNLV games, but I doubt they're going to play in Allegiant. I doubt they would let them play in Allegiant on a, on a, uh, no capacity, especially when no Raider. I mean, I guess eventually they're going to let Raider fans in soon, I'm sure. Um, but uh, I don't know if they're going to let UNLV in because they said they're going to have to play some of their games still at Sam Boyd Stadium. Yeah, I, I thought they were going to play at Sam Boyd. Some games. So, I like the okay. Raiders, are, and that's so messed up because the Raiders, UNLV was, you know, a bar to this and the, from the beginning right. construction, so they should be. Uh, I'm just reading this article talking about the schedule. Today, uh, Utah State head coach Gary Anderson said he preferred a seven-game season um, because it gives the team about a month to prepare. Um, but, I mean, he's happy to be playing anyways. But I saw the seven-game season as making more sense too, honestly. I didn't know they would play eight. I think, And I think the whole point is, at the end of it, we might not have eight games. And I think um, that makes sense as well. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, uh, what do you see as from traditional seasons, Sean? What do you think in this compacted season what kind of challenges or maybe well, advantages we'll have I, I think eight is you know they're shooting for eight but they'll settle for seven or six or however many they'll they get in there um, 
I guess they'll just what go off percentages. Um, what are they looking at? Like a uh, five and five and two, five and two crossover games. So yeah, it'll be, interest- oh, it'll three, be interesting. It'll be interesting to yeah. see what the the Cal schools do. Like I saw that San Jose State's gonna have to practice hundreds of miles away because. Oh, they, they didn't get uh, they didn't get that approval then. From, they didn't. Because yeah, they had no, to get no, the no, county approval, gonna, right? Wow. Yeah. So they're gonna have to go practice hundreds of miles away. Wow. So, yeah. Crazy. I mean, that's the whole. <laughs> it goes back to. Okay, whatever. It you gotta do what you gotta do. That's how much people you love college football. You gotta do what you gotta do. You gotta be ready to roll. So. Oh wow. Um. Well, as it comes um to the eight games and no buys and trying to fit it in that window. Um, I mean, nothing can go wrong basically. Right. It's like, right. What happens if a team goes, you know, five and three and another team goes like four and two or something, you know, it's like, I, I, I'm, I'm wondering what, what kind of weird tiebreakers could come from it in case teams don't play the whole games. Cause already, we are, we already know there are teams in division one that are not going to play the whole schedule. That already started to see right. because some teams had to push their games back four weeks consecutively. So, right. like, to imagine that there are no problems at all is is a fantasy because there will be. Um, but at the same time, that's the whole point of why these mechanisms, these um, policies, guidelines were put into place, anticipating these things happening. So that's why I, you know most people are. Some people will freak out like, oh my gosh. Um, but really, what you know, uh, what we were trying to do is just minimize the risk as much as possible and mitigate any kind of um, you know situations wherein players have to be close to it. and like obviously you can't help it when they're on the field or whatever um, but the game's outdoors and there's a lot to do um, but also Sean this is well, something that I want to okay okay say what you want to say first I have to bring up something else yeah uh, and we might have to deal with the the possibility of there might be forfeitures you know yeah. if we have like an outbreak on the offensive line we might not be able to play a week yeah. or another team might not be able to come over. So uh, forfeits are definitely in play for this season. So we just got to do the best we can. <laughs> so um, there has been talk. And I, honestly, I'm somebody who at this point, why not? If there's no fans of having the games at <laughs> King Field. And there's a reason, there's a few reasons why I'm behind it for one thing is we don't have to pay the rent for the stadium. A, save money there. B, there's a parking lot, which looks directly down into the game, which I would hope they would keep open, but, you know, probably not. But there's a lot of places for people that, you know, casual people that really want to watch to probably be able to catch the game from a bird's eye view or just from the fence on the outside, right? Unless we get pushed away. So that's two reasons, but... I mean, how do you feel about that when you hear something like that? Well, you're talking about T.C. Ching? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, as opposed I guess to it, which Ching? As opposed to... As opposed to... <laughs> as opposed stadium, to I, the old Honolulu Stadium. We're going to play in the park right now by the Bolorama before they turn it into that high-rise for a DHHL or something. I no. would rather have T.C. Ching with social distancing than an empty Aloha Stadium. Mm. Let's just put it that way. You know, but that would be uh, significantly it, less fans. Okay, if we're going to have fans, though, we have to have it at the stadium just because not everybody's going to fit. Okay, you're right. Just Okay, no. But I'm saying, like, you're right. Okay, but hmm, how many people could you even have socially distanced at TC Ching? I mean, maybe, like, maybe 300 people. I mean, yeah, they're going to make them sit really it far be apart. Much because you can fit a couple thousand in there. Yeah, like, it would have to be enough because I think the, the revenue stream – would be important for the game too. Obviously, if possible, they're going to need to take advantage of a revenue stream, and the games would, um, you know, clearly provide that, even if they are significantly less people than usual. Because um, expenses this year, I'm wondering if they're gonna, if they're, if they're gonna waive the the kind this year. The um, travel subs. Yes. And right. It's not- extenuating circumstances see this is something i'm talking about right now so right now if if some of you are unaware that we pay uh, uh subsidies to teams that fly into mountain west we have to pay them like what two hundred thousand dollars two hundred fifty thousand dollars to come 
our own conference, yeah. our own team, our own teams within our own conference. So that's very strange. For one thing. We, we have to um, pay for chartered flights from the yeah. West Coast to Hawaii. Anyways, I feel like this would be a circumstance when they could be waived because that's going to wipe out any any kind of, you know, income that they, they receive, first of all. But the other teams are going to be like, well, we're going to have less profit. We're going to have two. We're going to have less revenue, too, and we rely on those subsidies. So I I think that should be fought for, if anything, because if you keep um, – I don't know. I'm just. I, that's how I feel, Sean. What do you What do you have to say? Well, yeah. Is, I mean, isn't UH looking at a ten million dollar deficit if they don't play yeah, this like year? Yeah, twenty. So I, huge, huge. And if you take out the fans, are like, what? How are they gonna do pay per view? Are they gonna jack up the price of pay per view? I mean, so, look. I think. I think this is just again to minimize loss. Like everything is just minimize risk, minimize loss, minimize virus. Right. This year is not about like about just going over over and beyond it's about getting through right. and surviving and surviving for next year which is something i talked about with you before mm -hmm. and this program because it is very much like you said or like we talked about publicly funded and mm -hmm. it's a public entity and um those people on that campus they or those the the department the players everybody they share campus with academics who aren't not all of them so keen on having such a robust um, athletic department. Um, one which pays the execs combined over you know a million dollars, basically, or at least their their staff, their head, their executive staff. So, um, and coaches to get you know. So I mean, when you look at that, compare that to getting bringing professors in, keeping accreditation at you know certain colleges that they're losing them at. Or losing colleges, what what public health or what some they already lost one one department. So I mean, like, those are real issues as well. So those cannot be denied when people are saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like right now, is this what we want to do? I mean, how do you, how would you say that to that people, Sean? Like, oh, you wait, well, yeah, how come you get any football? The, the groans are only going to get louder for you know yeah. getting rid of football for the need for to not build the stadium. You know, if you don't have football, you don't need the new stadium, mm -hmm. and we can yeah. save a lot of money yeah. there. Yeah, and that's you know we're, yeah. we're he hemorrhaging money for the mm -hmm. rail. Mm -hmm. You know, they're looking at it won't be ready for another four years beyond what they already anticipated. So yeah, uh, and yeah, following a pandemic, it's they're going to be wanting to cut money and save money in the budget. So yeah. it, I mean, it's hard. It is, and especially with with the program on a downward trend, you. There's no other way to put yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. We're trending in the wrong direction. You know? Yeah, we are. We've and talked about this many times before on your show. And we have. And, and the um, thing is the, that this is a time, a call to people to support the team in any way you can, going to the games, buying gear, right? Yeah. Buying jerseys, right. buying flags, like all of that stuff that goes back. Buying food at the stadium, surprisingly not directly to the, the team, although no. good to have. That's convenient. <laughs> but buying tickets, buying season tickets, I mean... Mm -hmm. And that's something this year as well. I think there still will need to be cuts. There still will need to be places that um, I'm surprised. That I, I'm not advocating. I hope we can save all of our sports, but it's shocking to me so far that we haven't lost any sports, and I'm hoping not. I mean, I'm not. I want all the student athletes to be able to have all the opportunities because I believe in the power of sports and as many teams as possible. But just seeing that trend, it's kind of scary. Um, <clears throat> and. Um, no cap, as the kids would say, I'd be afraid if I were on some of those periphery sports because um, yes. you don't know where it's going to come. And I played one of those in college too, men's volleyball, which is already cut at Stanford. Um, and cut at teams that I played already. <clears throat> in college, I used to play like St. Francis, of their D1 team in New York. We used to play a bunch of schools that had um, that Loyola Marymount had a team before. They don't have a team anymore. Long Beach didn't have a team before they brought a team back and then won the national championship. So, um, it, it, it's real. The reality is there. So I, I'm surprised that a lot of, um, you know, that it hasn't happened yet, but at the same time, we just got to get through this year, right? Just get through this year. Right. So what do you see right. in your crystal ball, Sean, if you're looking into how this season would go? Um, because we already have the outbreak today, like we talked about, um, <laughs> which I don't think we should be too worried about. The, the test results are going to come back tonight. They're going to identify the people who are positive. Keep them away from each other. Everybody else, let them test. I mean, they're false positives. They'll keep testing them until they're not, until they get a certain amount of positives in a row as well. 
So I don't believe that they have, it's not like they have to quarantine for 14 days. I think you just have to like be able to pass the test a few times, you know? And that's something that's a little scary too. If you're flying to Hawaii, believe, believe that. They won't right. let you back on the plane if you don't pass the test. So you come to Hawaii right. and you and you get, and you contract a virus and you test positive before the flight home, you have to stay in Hawaii. And that's kind of, I'm wondering like, whoa, how many people are going to be like just chilling on the mm-hmm. beach because they can't get home? <laughs> I mean, you gotta. Who knows how many more days you have to, um, you know, you have to, extend. Uh, yeah, extend. So, yeah. Uh, but anyways, it, in those things affect, and that's why when the commissioner talked about talking to David E. Gay, our, the governor of Hawaii, and how mm-hmm. involved the governor would have to be, because just like at Stanford or in Santa Clara County, the government. Uh, still had the final world word it's like all of these press conferences were being held and everybody's getting really excited but government officials who truly do have the last say really have not yet been totally in on it and that's clearly what happened in hawaii that's clearly and not that um you know that the governor should be even worried about uh right now he has other things to worry about i think that uh football is super important and we should keep it forever and i will always be there to defend it to the death um but I, um, I'm sure he has other funds. Like, I don't know if he's going to use any of the CARES Act money to save the program. I mean, that would probably get a little bit of pushback. Um, but I mean, when you think about how the program is funded and, and what function it serves in our state and our island, it does serve a pretty big function. I mean, you talked about even for your life, right, Sean? I mean, the, you know, right. how you're I mean, the, the program is very important to so many people here. You know, there's a huge difference between uh, work on a Monday morning if UH wins or loses. So uh, I, I still think it's a 50-50 proposition on whether we're going to play or not. You know, there's just whether so we're going to play any games at all. You're saying? Yeah. So wow. I, okay. I just well, I mean, so many things could happen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, we, we might play all road games. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's possible depending on what e game. Uh, decides mm-hmm. if if he's going to drop the quarantine or if he's going to make an exemption for visiting Mountain West mm-hmm. teams, you know. Mm-hmm. Nobody's going to want to come here and spend 2 weeks here after they play us. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, I'm sure if if you get creative, you can come up, you know, you just quarantine them to the hotel, you stick them on an airplane right after the game. I'm sure there's ways to figure it out because, you know, th- this program and these games would mean a lot to us. And, and, you know, to the people of Hawaii mm-hmm. and to its fans. I agree. And I think that if they are to play fairly, they, they should be the home team at least half the time, whether that is in Hawaii or not. Because mm-hmm. uh, I would say it's 50-50 whether we play in Hawaii or not. I believe that we will get on the field. Um, and I believe I'd say like maybe more than you, slightly, 75%, like 80%. Because okay. just because of... Uh, we've already gone this far. And like I said before, and I told you privately even, which is clearly not private anymore, but I'm saying it right now, is that it feels sometimes a little icky to be playing when people are like, so you wouldn't get this money from this TV contract if you don't play, right? So you don't do this, right. you don't get this. Hmm. And they're like, no, no. And like for me, for us as fans, we don't make money. We spend money on this team. We give them money. So like we, for us, it's already pure you know emotion and for fans that's why fans are like advocating for like just play whatever play i mean a lot of them don't understand the nuances of being in a game and being around uh you know how how uh just the optics of it as well politically right we're not even talking about like being able to make the game go we're talking about the optics surrounding it because that's just as important any step that we take right now is going to have ramifications in the future. I know that for sure, right? And the goal is just to keep the program afloat. Well, and I think that because of our position in the Mountain West, that we are only a football member, yeah. that we're paying for our membership. I think that there's a common feeling among Hawaii fans, like if they're going to screw anybody, it's going to be Hawaii. <laughs> yep. you know, I, and uh, just wondering, like, waiting for the other shoe to drop is it going to be uh the mountain west that sets us up for failure or is it going to be our governor so i think (laughs) a lot of people are just kind of like squeezing yeah just squeezing waiting to see you know because i'm 
I, I'm terrified to see what this schedule is going to look like. Yeah. You know, they're, I, I doubt they're going to do us any favors. Well, I mean, the fact that they're kind of waiting now, can you imagine if they're going to publish it today and that happened? You know, they, you know, they wouldn't do it still. I'm wondering, you know, I'm wondering what would stop them. Maybe they would, maybe they'd be like, okay, well, this is the schedule. Good luck. Cause I think they're going to do that anyways. So I'm wondering why they just didn't drop well, it already, but well, I think they're going to give, much, how much longer can we go without putting it out? Like, well, that's what I mean. The Santa Clara, like you said, if Santa Clara didn't approve it, if Ike didn't say anything yet, if nothing is going through, they're going to have to put it out. And there's probably contingencies. So, so, like, so we're going to go to like October 15th and they're going to say, hey, guess where you're going next week? I, you know? I'm scared of that. I'm scared of that. <laughs> Honestly, like I am because it's just kind of hamajang. We have to like, it's not like this is like, it takes like years to make a schedule for college football. It's not Absolutely. like they just make the, the schedule the year before. They do the schedule like five years in advance, at least almost the whole schedule. Mm -hmm. A lot of Power 5 teams, like no more Pukas on their schedule. They have like teams lined up for years, right? I mean, UCLA had coming, we had UCLA coming here for years, and that's like, they're like Haley's Comet or something when they come to UH uh, to play, so we're going to well, be dead by the time they come back, probably. Wayne, I've been waiting for 30 <laughs> years to get UCLA here, and, you know, of know, all the years too. for them to finally, they haven't been here in like 50 years. Yeah, yeah. I know they played in like a Aloha Bowl uh, back in the 90s, I believe, but, ugh. I really want. I think we could have beaten them this year. They yeah. were down, and yeah. I think we had like. That, that I think. I mean, down. like, perfect. Just going to Arizona for coach to go back to Arizona. That'd be cool. Mm -hmm. Playing UCLA, which is a middle of the pack, Pac-12 team. Um, I mean, we had a chance. I think to start off a, a, a decent shot. Obviously, having a new coach, a new system. I nobody can be super excited about, it, especially when there's no spring. It is difficult, mm -hmm. but I, I have faith that, you know, in the time being, the, the players, the coaches have bought into it, and that's the thing that's most important, you know. It's like, what is the buzz around the program? What are, how are players feeling? And a lot of players um, seem to respond well, and that's really important. Like, the, the, the attitude, the spirit around the program is super vital, I think, to the team, and um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, um, especially if you have a lot of talent. Our friend RJ, shout out to RJ Hollis, posted a photo or some shared about his 2015 team and how that team was a great team, and they were. Um, and that's a team that went to Ohio State and Wisconsin and, um, you know, played no buys. Um, that was a crazy right. pair, and that team still, you know, did as much as they could. And um, that was still a fun year, too, you know, being able to go. And, and really, had we had a semblance of an offense, we probably would have kept it closer. Ohio State, the number one team in the country, we played that day, and they raised the banner while we were there in the stands. And it was funny; they raised mm -hmm. it right above where the other Hawaii fans were sitting, so they're all shockying in front of it. But uh, that was a fun experience, and you know, we were it was 14-0 in the fourth quarter. Yeah, and then we it was 31-0 right to the very end. Yeah, like yeah, if we had had an offense, any kind of offense that yeah. day, we we might have been able to pull the shocker. <laughs> the shocker. That, they they were number one, right? Yeah, they were number one that day. Yeah. Yeah, they were, they were number, number one. one. Yeah. I mean, Ezekiel Elliott played in that game. Joey Bosa mm -hmm. played in that game. Uh, so right. the kind Dwayne Haskins played in that game. Three current NFL players who are starting right now were in that game. At least that's the only ones I can say off the top of my head. So, and Ohio State, when you get all kind of talent like that, dang. Um, and I mean, we're seeing it this year. I mean, college talent, D one talent, the star talent. It's crazy because rookies are playing really well in the NFL as well. Not to change the subject too much, but we're seeing that um, you know transition. But back to UH, you can come to UH and still be a great player, still make it all the way um, to the NFL. I mean, when you look at that, there was another tweet as well. Did you see that stat about like how many four and five star players were on like certain rosters compared, like LSU who lost to the kind or Arkansas State had beat? Because there's all kind like. Uh, be in the south um the mac or um some of those teams are pulling off upsets sunbelt teams um and mm -hmm. you know it, it that's the kind of uh hopefully talent level where you know coach Graham might not be able to get that same level of talent he was getting at the pac-12 but that Tulsa level talent and better mm -hmm. he can get i mean but on the recruiting side sean what are you um looking forward to as well well you know like alabama they just stack four and five star recruits you know like yeah three and four deep so whereas at hawaii you might have a single line 
well, that's why injuries are so important. Mm-hmm. Once you have injuries, the, the second string guys come in, and there's a there's a higher drop off than you know, like at Ohio State or yeah. or Alabama. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's it's not shocking to see these little teams like you know hang with the big boys. We, it happens every year. When you uh, are thinking about the okay, so if uh, the team we talked about this before the season, if if there are fans allowed, um, what are your you would you be at the game? Just so you're going to be at the game, if fans are allowed. Uh, I still need to have that discussion with my wife. Oh, okay, so, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Well, but I mean, obviously, people anyone would be apprehensive about being in the stadium. What are the biggest concerns? Do you think that you would have as a fan? COVID, absolutely COVID. So, but I mean, you're outdoors, you can stay right. Do you think that you could keep distance outside? Do you think that people aren't going to wear their masks? I mean, what do you think is the biggest? Yeah, all of the above. You know, you're just, you're out there and you don't know what was cleaned or mm-hmm. when it was cleaned. or True. Who's going to come and sit by you. And like, that's why they True. should just make it open seating and you know, either lower deck or upper deck, and just you just figure out yourself. Someone yeah, comes no one is sitting in my seat. Team. Anybody even tries to sit on my seat, they're gonna be thrown onto the. No, I'm <laughs> yeah. No, but you're right. So, um, if they open seating would make sense because they'd be able to properly um, spread people out. <clears throat> well, because gar- like guaranteed, someone's gonna come in and say, "Oh, you're you know you're too close, bro." Like. Yeah. You don't want fights in the stands. It's like. <laughs> Yeah, if they get True. too close, you just get up and you move over. Well, hopefully, bit. the people that go to the games would be cooperative. It's not. It's going to be a very different experience, even more. I'm worried. I have uh, eight people in my season ticket party, so are we not? We're not all in the same household either. So, I mean, I'm wondering if there will be restrictions there as well when it comes to, you know, who can sit next to each other and and stuff like that. I mean, that's something that needs to be thought about. Obviously, tailgating is probably out of the question. I would imagine. Well, yeah. Doesn't the governor like not want anyone? there until like december Isn't yeah it? even in california i mean it's not supposed to be until like 2021 that there's anybody in the stadium at all that's why the rams were just right. like no fans this year like the rest of 2020 like hard i mean that's why every time sports pushes the envelope and is able to do something that it shows just how powerful sports is for one thing people mm-hmm. will deny that even though sports is powerful but also it the matters. fact that it's like it comes at a cost as well. So who's paying the, the burden of, of, of this, you know? The, if players are being put in harm's way and something happens to them and it's like directly caused because of playing, that would be hard to live with, I think, for some of these programs and would be quite the burden, I think, uh, for a university to have that kind of hit on their image uh, of any school. I mean, so they have to be worried about that as well. I think, yeah, you know, contraction is likely... And we can just hope that if it's caught, maybe the sooner you catch it, the quicker, um, you know, you're pulled out of that situation. I don't know. I know it comes to the viral load and stuff. So maybe you're not, you're not close to each other. You're not, if you're not in close enough proximity, maybe it won't, the effects won't be as bad. So a lot of stuff we don't know, like you said. Um, yeah. And that's scary as well. I just, a lot of it's just minimizing risk, you know? Yeah. And it's a, I think it's a personal decision you have to make too. It's yeah. like, you know, is this worth going there? Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, what precautions am I going to take if I do? So yeah. it's, it's, it's all on the individual. But I think what we've done this year is proven that, um, you know, nothing is going to be normal. Nothing is going to be the way it's supposed to be. So we all have to be engaged in, um, you know, uh, the battle on our on our own terms too. We have to. Mm-hmm distance we have to wear masks when you're outside when you're around other people i mean if you know a uh football player if you are related to one do not see them don't even talk to them don't go near them i mean and that's really i think a part of the conference policy they they, i didn't see any kind of policy they talked about a bubble for each team obviously it's going to be a bubble that's probably a lot looser than most bubbles because players live off campus they live in pololo they live all over right you know they they um it's not as if uh all the players live on campus in one dorm. So it's hard to, to bubble them in, in one place. But at the same time, um, it's on the players. It's their responsibility, right? And it's their kuleana, mm-hmm. as we say in Hawaii. So that's Auntie Penny's Hawaiian word of the day is kuleana. And um, <clears throat> I have to interject more with Aloha into this, into this show since this is a Hawaiian program. Um, but it's important that the players have to know their responsibility. 
No can just go any kind of parties. No can just troll parties, have people come over. I cannot do that. Can I have any parties, period? Like this requires a sacrifice on part of the players. And that's what I'm saying. If it's a burden too great for people because they cannot party or they cannot not see their family, it's a hard thing, right? Like LeBron, I'm sure he misses his kids. He doesn't want to bring them into the bubble. So there's not really anything for them to do. Like he said, there's nothing for them to do. Why would I have? Of course I miss them. But as an athlete, as an athlete that's aiming to win a championship, that's where it starts. It starts when you're mentally how committed you are to this program. And by the program, I mean the guidelines set forth by which we can run a successful season. Uh, I know uh, Sean has to leave us right now, so we'll let him go. But uh, thanks yeah. for joining us, Sean. I'll get thanks, you on the next thanks one. Thanks for having me on. Looking, I'm hoping, I'm praying for a season. Or praying along with play. you. Shoot. Talk to you soon. All right. Following. And that's our friend, uh, Sean. Um, and... Uh, Sean Iman, I'm, I'm sure you've seen him a few times on our on our show, and uh, something that I enjoy about having a relationship with a lot of fans like Sean, like <clears throat> obviously Fuchsia and Kaylee, other people you see at games with me, is that uh, we know and we understand Park Juliana, our responsibility to the program as fans, but as stakeholders within the program, and. Um, as guardians of the program, because I think at this time as well, it's very um, pivotal that we show as fans, as citizens of Hawaii, that this team is important, that the success of this team is important, not just the existence of it, but the success of it. And what can we do to not only help the team, but how does it, how does it enhance Hawaii? How does it make Hawaii a better place? Which I believe it does, and sports in general, but this football team as well. Um, Thanks, everybody, for joining me out there. Thanks, Sean. Go back and watch from the beginning if you missed it because in the beginning I talked a little bit about um, or I shared some videos, talked about Coach Todd Graham, who we're super excited to um, eventually have on the show. Maybe. So we'll talk to Coach Graham when he's um, probably a lot less uh, busy and we just send him his, uh, we send him our aloha. Uh, we send him our love as um, he takes the helm of the program through this really um, unprecedented time because that phrase can never be said enough. For Sean Iman, who my special guest tonight, and for all those who helped support this program, all those people who use the video, mahalo for all the production you did there and what it is for my program. Thank you so much. So a shout out to you folks as well. I'll see you guys next time. Aloha. Thank you.